All right, it is 12.01. I'm going to turn over um, the intro to Lauren and to Katie, and I will cut myself off. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Hello. Thank you, everyone. We are so excited you guys are here today with us. Um, I am so excited to welcome Katie Werlin to join us today for our next in our series of Lunch and Learn Lectures. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to learn a little bit about getting dressed in the 18th century, something that we at the museum are always very excited about. Uh, and I'm excited to welcome you here to our museum from home, basically. Now, before we get started and before I introduce our speaker, I just want to take a brief moment to go over a couple of things about how this is going to work. I know one of the things that we're all getting very good at is a little bit of digital learning, but so I think most of us have probably already seen something similar to this before, but just in case, uh, please make sure that you mute your microphones and turn off your video. Uh, when you want to ask a question, if you can go to the chat function right at the bottom, if you're not super familiar with Zoom, what you're going to do is you're going to take your cursor and bring it towards the bottom of the screen and it should pop up with a little thought bubble or speech bubble, and you can type your question directly into there. There's gonna be time at the end of the program to ask any of these kind of questions, and Angel is gonna uh, pop back on and join us for that particular part of it. Uh, now, if you need help, if you're having some sort of technical difficulty and can't figure something out, please use that same chat function to ask those questions, and one of us will be happy to help you uh, sort of troubleshoot there. But thank you again for joining us. We're so excited to have you here today. And uh, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speaker today, who we are so excited to have. Uh, Katie Worland is a fashion and textile historian who has been making historical costuming for over 15 years now. Uh, she has a degree in dramatic art from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a master's degree in visual culture, costume studies from New York University with the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Chicago History Museum, Judith Lieber, and is now an independent fashion historian. Uh, but she's perhaps best known as the time-traveling redhead. And if you have not gotten a chance to take a look at some of the things she's made, definitely go pop over to her Instagram or her Facebook, and you can also see one of her favorite costumes that she's currently wearing there. So thank you, Katie, for joining us. We're so excited you're here. Hi, very, very happy to be here. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I think we have to start by kind of taking a look at what historical costuming is. So uh, one of the questions that I think everyone probably has is what is the difference between a uh, historical costumer and a historical interpreter? Very good question. Um, I think the, the difference is really the intention behind it. So historical interpreters and reenactors, they're trying to be as historically accurate as humanly possible as we can get in this day and age for the purposes of education and learning, both educating the public um, and educating themselves, educating each other, um, really trying to immerse themselves in history as much as possible. Now, historical costumers, we aren't necessarily doing this for an education purpose. We come in a lot of different flavors. There's people who are trying their hardest to be as historically accurate. There's people that just enjoy the process of creating. And um, some people stick straight with history, others mix and match time periods. So there's a lot more fluidity and freedom um, there to kind of be really creative and just sort of approach history and sewing and historical fashion in whichever way you particular want, particularly want to. Lauren, you're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh no. Here we go. Sorry. This is what I get for trying to do this. I, as I said, we're all learning here and I did so wonderfully last time at this that it was bound to happen this time. Of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I have to ask this question. You are wearing a particularly gorgeous gown here and you just kind of talked a little bit about what being a historical costumer is. Uh, I have to ask. Tell me about this gown. <laughs> well, um, I'll have my cameraman move the camera back a bit so I can stand up and you can see it a bit better. So, um, I, keep going. I think you should be close to me now. <laughs> so, uh, this is um, uh, early 1790s dress. So this is from the very end of the century. This is what's known as a robe à l'anglaise. And sort of the defining feature of it is the fitted back. So as you can see, it fits straight to my back. Um, and flows down. Um, it's what's known as the English gown. That's what robe à l'anglaise means. 
Um, and it's differentiated from the robe a la Francaise, which has a loose back. Um, that's what I'm wearing in the picture you used for all of um, the marketing for this Lunch and Learn. So this is 1790, 1791. So this is kind of the end of the century. Um, so we're getting into more of the neoclassical styles as opposed to all the floofiness of the Rococo. So you can see it's characterized by a lot less decoration, a lot simpler lines, a lot cleaner patterns. I've just got white and some very graphic stripes. Um, and yeah, this is actually, this is one of my favorite costumes I've made. So I thought it was a good one to um, wear for this presentation. Excellent. Well, you actually just brought up something really important. You said this is a 1790s gown and it's uh, characterized by a little bit more simplistic designs. So obviously the 18th century is an explosion of all of these different trends, all these incredible things that are happening. Um, so what really sets the 18th century apart in terms of its fashion? What do we see changing? Oh my gosh, so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit back down really quick. <laughs> just... uh, and while you sit down, let me explain. The 18th century is um, 1700s. I know sometimes that's a little confusing. I work with a lot of our school children and uh, 18th century is a very foreign word for them. So 18th century refers to the 1700s. All right. Hopefully all of me and my hair is still in the shot. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So uh, the 18th century is a time of enormous transition. Um, it's a time of frivolity. This is some of the fluffiest, craziest fashion you'll see throughout history on both men and women. This is the last time in history that menswear is just as colorful and highly decorated as women's wear. Once you get into the 19th century, you start to see men wearing, you know, dark clothes, the suits, the sort of things we associate with menswear today. Um, is incredible time of, of culture and trade. Um, there was sort of an explosion of cross-cultural uh, interactions within the 18th century. So one of the kind of big defining things in 18th century fashion is um, printed textiles, printed cottons, um, which originally come from India. And then they were brought over, um, they started kind of coming over in the 17th century, but they really took off in the 18th century. And then it, the European market starts taking that technology, adapting it for themselves, um, and is able to produce, you know, incredible designs, very topical um, patterns, you know, based on whatever was happening in the day, the politics of the day, the operas and theater of the day. Um, you're seeing a lot of new technologies. You see the very first computers in the 18th century, and they're used for fashion. So the Jacquard loom um, allowed silk weavers to weave incredibly complex patterns. Um, and it ran on a punch card system, which is the first computing technology in the world. And um, that was uh, invented during the 18th century. So you're just seeing an explosion of creativity, of cross-cultural influences, of um, fashion traveling all over the world. There's really wonderful paintings from China where you can see European 18th century textiles in the painting because there's so much cultural exchange going on. There's technology and there's so much politics in fashion. Um, it's a very, very political time for fashion, which I personally find very interesting. That's one of my big research interests. You see during the French Revolution as a classic example, an entire group of revolutionaries define themselves by their fashion, the sans culotte. So there, that literally means without breeches because they were defining themselves um, by the fact that they wore long trousers. So it's an incredibly fascinating period to look at from so many different angles, not just from what they're wearing, but the political angle, the economic angle, the philosophical angle. Um, and that's where my research as a historian tends to look. Excellent. So really what we're seeing with the 18th century is an incredible connection between our material culture and everything else that's happening. Uh, now, one of the things that I kind of see when it comes to 18th century fashion is suddenly you're seeing people that are having access to things that they haven't had access to before. Would you mind telling us a little bit about sort of what um, the average person is wearing, uh, what the difference in class structure, all of this, because fashion does become such a social standing. Yeah. Um, well, this is obviously something that an uh, upper class person would wear. Um, it's all made out of silks, but 
there is a lot of, of mixing around. So there was a thriving secondhand clothing market. market. So once the upper classes were done with their outfits, they didn't just throw them away. It got passed on. And so you go to like ye olde Goodwill and pick up you know, um, some cast offs. There was also, because of the proliferation of technology, a lot of people had more access to things. So um, printed textiles is a classic example. That's something that started out when it was first being imported from India as a luxury item that only the most wealthy could afford. By the end of the century, literally every single social class has access to printed textiles. They're being churned out so quickly in so many different patterns. Um, and so it, some of those patterns even um, mimic like embroidery and um, woven fabrics. So you see that the lower classes can participate in some of the more elaborate de decorative styles while still on um, a smaller budget. And you see um, so many different patterns. Um, it really was just an explosion of, of prints and colors. Um, uh, there's some wonderful research done at the Foundling Museum in London, and a lot of the orphans that were dropped off were had like a token so that they could be identified, and a lot of times it was a little swatch of fabric because there were so many different prints out there and types out there that, that could really help become a unique identifier. Um, so a lot of people had a lot more access than in previous centuries. Can you tell us about some of the typical patterns that you would see? Obviously stripes, you're wearing them, but. <laughs> um, it changes throughout the century. So the beginning of the century, you're seeing lots of really big elaborate floral patterns. Um, there's actually a wonderful trend in the 1720s called bizarre silks. And if you look at them, you think they were modern art from like the 1920s or 1950s, kind of that um, thing. It's, they're very strange. They're weird shapes. They look like Picasso designed them. Um, as you get further along in the century, you're seeing a lot of florals, um, it's getting a bit more natural, and then as you progress, sort of the patterns get smaller and smaller and more simple as we move from a very extravagant Baroque aesthetic through the Rococo to neoclassical. Um, in terms of printed textile, though, sky's the limit. You got stripes, you got your polka dots, I've seen a playing card novelty print, um, all sorts of stuff. and. Um, what we think of today as toal, you know, the, the cotton with the little black or blue figures, those were mostly used for furnishing fabrics, but you see those a lot. Um, and those were created to celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Independence, to celebrate famous military victories, to celebrate famous operas. So they could come out so fast that you're seeing so much variety and so much connection in the textile pattern to what is happening in the world. So it's almost like wearing history right on you at that moment, being able to say kind of things. Um, that is fascinating. I need to see this playing card fabric. That sounds really fun, especially as we're all playing board games and card games at I home. <laughs> um, now you used a couple of words to explain some of the styles. Uh, you used the word Baroque, um, Rococo. Can you tell us a little bit about what those different styles are and kind of the defining characteristics? Yeah. So. Baroque is really what we associate with the 17th century. So that's the 1600s, um, right before the 18th century. It's very ornamental, it's very heavy. So you think of um, big columns and very, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, it's a lot about the expression of power and like you are right here. Um, so lots of curves. Um, but it's very heavy and, and thick and dark. What you get in the 18th century is you move into a more Rococo aesthetic, which is once again, lots of curves, but it's a lot lighter. It's a lot more feminine. Um, and it's a lot more inspired by kind of the simplicity of nature and the natural world. So you see all these beautiful lines and curves and squiggles um, in, you know, flowers and lace and seashells. Um, and that was really more of a, a private aesthetic as opposed to some this monumental aesthetic of the Baroque. Um, so that develops throughout the 18th century. And then once you get to the end, um, you start getting neoclassicism, which is um, taking its inspiration from classical societies of Greece and Rome. So it's very, very simple. It's, you know, plain colors, small patterns, 
um, clean lines. You know, you can see the way the lines of this dress, they sort of mimic the lines of a column you know, a carved marble column that you might see on an ancient Greek temple. And that's kind of where the inspiration comes from. Um, so throughout the century, you're seeing this transition from the monumental to the intimate to the classical and the simple. Um, and that is then what defines the beginning of the 19th century and what we think of like Jane Austen styles. That's sort of where that neoclassical fashion head. Excellent. So it sounds like things that are happening in the fashion world are mimicking things that are happening in the architecture world, in the political world, in the um, the ceramics world. Uh, all of this is really intertied. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's absolutely fascinating. And I love the clean lines on the back of your dress. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the sort of the dress in the 18th century looks like? Well, what's involved? Obviously, you have a number of different layers. <laughs> all of the stitching mattered. It serves a purpose in it. It's not just kind of a hem. It has something else. Can you tell us about what, what that looks like? Right. Um, I can just kind of go through my layers. Um, I'll have a cameraman help me out again. I'm going to get rid of my video so everyone can see you a little bit bigger here. <laughs> um, OK, so. Uh, what you're seeing is several layers. So underneath I've got my base layer is a shift. Um, it's made of linen and it's basically like an undershirt. And this is what was going to get washed and changed every day because that's what soaks up all your body grossness <laughs> because you want to protect all of your silks and all of your beautiful fabrics. So over that I have my stays. Um, that is what the uh, people in the 18th century, what we think of as corsets, they were called stays. Um, it was called that up until the mid 19th century. Um, and that is giving me the, the fashionable um, conical shape. So you can see, I make basically in my torso a triangle and there's not a lot of curves. It's a, a very clean line conical shape. And that was really the style throughout the 18th century. The curvy silhouette um, doesn't really come in until the 19th. Um, so after that, I've got my, my petticoat, um, which uh, fills in the front of the dress that's held open by um, my robe. And then I've got the robe, obviously, which is this main thing. Um, it's got a false front, uh, so it's made to look like you know, uh, a striped robe over this, but the um, white bit on here on the bodice is actually attached to the side. So it's kind of an illusion effect. Um, I have, uh, as I said, a fitted back um, and I used uh, the stripes to sort of create a nice little pattern with that of curves. Um, and you can see I even matched the stripes on the bodice with the stripes on the skirt to kind of extend those clean lines and make them go out. Um, it's pleated in a very specific way in back, which is um, a very indicative of a certain style of dress because what the thing with 18th century is there's not just one type of dress. There's so many different types. Every little detail means that it's a new type of dress with a different name. You know, it's not just a robe all anglaise. This, you know, is a specific type, but there were so many others that, you know, can be defined by how the skirt is pulled up or the trimming or the cut of the bodice. So um, it's, it's hard to kind of define just one particular style. Um, as I said, this is a later style. Uh, so earlier, um, your fashion looks different, but it's the same basic components of a robe, um, a petticoat, and um, some sort of padding. Uh, so earlier in the century, you get panniers, which are those rectangle shaped things. Later in the century, you just got bum padding. So I've got some basically little pillows here under my skirt to give it that poof. Um, and uh, then of course your stays and uh, all your associated undergarments. <laughs> All right, so um, I had a feeling that you would bring up the particular undergarments that are there, the stays. And so I actually have a picture of some that you made. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here and I'm going to have you kind of explain what those undergarments look like because I know that's one of the biggest questions that we always get at the museum because obviously they're covered. The idea is that they're undergarments and everyone always wants to know what do they look like and why the conical shape. Uh, so give me just a moment here. I'm going to go ahead and share that so that we can take a look at it here. Give me just a second. All right.
All right, Katie, can you see the screen? I can. Excellent. All right. So obviously I gave a little, little preview there of what we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, one of my favorite things that I have ever seen, you actually had a ship in your hair. Uh, but to start out with, let's start out with the undergarments here. Can you tell us a little bit about what these are? So what you're seeing here is my shift and my stays. And um, there's actually a bit of a mismatch because my stays um, are uh, 1740s-ish in style, as is the shift, whereas my hair is 1790s. So I'm a bit fashion forward with the hair in this picture, but um, what you can see is they're boned. Uh, so what that means is there's something in it that makes them stiff. Uh, the boning in 18th century stays um, could be reed, which was sort of a cheaper option, or it could be whalebone. Um, which was the, the preferred option. Um, mine are boned with uh, German plastic boning, which is kind of the closest we can get to whalebone these days. Yeah, um, obviously we don't want to use whalebone in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but back then the whaling industry was huge and a lot of the reason was because women needed the boning for their stays. And so what that boning does, you can see, is that it just squishes my body into the correct shape. So just like wearing any kind of shaping garment today, like Spanx, it's just redistributing your fat. So there's a lot of misconceptions that women couldn't breathe, women couldn't move, it hurt. None of that's true. Um, it really is just moving the body around and your body is a lot squishier than you think. So um, it creates that beautiful cone-shaped silhouette that also then serves as the base that the fabric can lay so smooth and beautifully on because there's a nice flat surface there and it's a nice strong surface. Um, the other thing, as I said, there is my shift, which that is what was worn closest to the body. Um, fabric was so incredibly expensive. You're not throwing this in the wash every single day, especially these luxury fabrics. So the shift was such an important base feature because that's what soaks up your sweat and your dirt and your body oils, and you can throw that in the wash no problem. Um, meanwhile, protecting your beautiful outer layers. Excellent. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing here real quick because I see that we've got a lot of questions that are coming through the chat. Um, Angel, do you want to join us and tell us a little bit about what some people are asking? Sure, so I am not going to share my video, I'll just share my voice. So we got a question about um, your particular dress that you're wearing right now, Katie, about how, I think it's a question, um, the front part of the dress attached the way we know from the, I don't know how to say that, um, like a stomacher, or is there a different type of closure at the front? So can you explain the construction of the top? Sure, um, so this closes right down the front. Um, and that's actually a defining feature of the majority of 18th century dress, is it closes down the front. So um, court dress would close down the back, but most um, daily styles of dress close down the front. So um, I'll just stand up and kind of walk a bit closer. Um, you can see it's closed down the front with pins. You could also be sewn into the dress. Um, I've done that before. I chose pins today. Um, but it really, it just opens like a jacket. Um, so this white thing is, a, as I said, it's a false front. So it's not a separate piece. It's not a stomacher. It's attached directly here to the, um, to the uh, striped fabric. And um, that's very uh, indicative of this time period. You see a lot of these false fronts that mimic um, a stomacher uh, from earlier in the century, but aren't. It's a bit of a simplicity in construction, which is nice because I have less layers to worry about. Um, and then one detail I always love to point out because I'm crazy, I actually sewed this with two different color threads. So I sewed these pink stripes with a light pink thread and these cranberry stripes with a cranberry colored thread all the way around the, the dress, uh, just because I'm that kind of crazy person that likes putting in those little details. <laughs> Good to match. Um, there was another question about the changing layers of women's clothing. So you talked a little bit about the um, how the styles have changed. Obviously, you can't wear that many layers underneath like a neoclassical dress. So how does that change over time? The basic components really do stay the same. The shift and the stays are always the foundation layer throughout the entire time period. The shape of the stays changes slightly, but they're always there. Um, it's really just then what creates the shape. So if I were to wear this dress without any padding, it would just 
kind of hang down. It's, it's not as big and intimidating as you think. And that's the same with, with all 18th century clothes. The clothing itself is, it's, it's pretty basic um, in terms of its construction and in terms of how it hangs. So it's really the padding and the undergarments that give it the correct shape and create this huge intimidating silhouette that you see. So earlier in the century, you're getting um, more of a, a circular uh, silhouette and then it quickly goes into the kind of rectangular square silhouette that we most associate with the century. Um, and that's created by pannier, um, which are these little side hoop thingies that you wear. Um, and then as the century progresses, that silhouette gets narrower again, and we devolve into just some bum padding, which is what I'm wearing right now. And then eventually you'll have no padding at all, but the um, basic components of the stays in the petticoat um, or a petticoat and um, a shift are always staying the same. It's just what do you layer on top of it to build out the shape? I have a follow-up question to that because it's something, I'll be honest, I get asked all the time. Exactly how long does it take to get dressed and can you get dressed by yourself? We all have that image of that political cartoon where the woman's holding on to the bed as someone's pulling her into her space. Can you tell us about this? <laughs> yeah. It does not take as long as I think movies like to portray. Um, I got ready um, in about half an hour today. I did my hair and makeup earlier, but I actually put on my dress um, in about a half an hour um, or so, and I did it all by myself. So, um, oh. <laughs> sorry, I was getting a notification from the thing. I didn't know if you guys could see me. Sorry. You could get dressed by yourself. So obviously a woman who could afford this type of dress would have a lot of servants um, that would get her dressed for her, but in a pinch, she could do it herself. And a lot of people who couldn't afford servants would just do it themselves. Um, the trick is that everything closes in the front. So you just put it on like a jacket, put it up the front, you're good to go. The stays, my stays are earlier in style and they close up the front. Um, a lot of stays in the 18th century lace up the back. Some of them lace up the front and the back, but in a pinch, I have laced myself into back lacing stays. You just kind of lace it loosely in front and then swivel it around and then sort of reach behind you to tighten it. Um, so obviously dressing could become much more of a ritual. There was a trend in the 18th century for um, the morning toilette. So what that would be is a well-to-do woman would have her stays on and her shift and maybe like a little robe or something over it and would invite friends and society people and intellectuals and they would come and hang out with her and chat with her and watch her get dressed. It was an entire process, an entire ritual. That was really taken to the extreme in the French court um, where it was a very important political act that different people of different ranks in the court got to hand different bits of garments to um, the king or the queen. Um, so dressing could take a very long time. It could be a huge ritual. It absolutely could use lots of servants, but um, the common people who didn't have all of that, they weren't completely left out. I mean, you can 100% get yourself into these things um, easily enough and um, you, you can make it work. So you don't, you don't need a lady's maid, <laughs> which I do not have, so. <laughs> Um, how many garments do you think someone would typically have? Obviously, again, you're dressed as uh, sort of the highest of the high, an aristocrat, probably in the European court system. But out here, so we're in Charlotte here at the museum, and this is sort of, I always joke, a teeny tiny speck of dust on the map. Um, how many types of clothing do you think people would normally have? How many changes of clothing? Not a lot. Even the highest of the high. Obviously, royalty had a whole bunch of outfits. Um, there's very famous stories about the incredibly enormous wardrobes that royalty had. But even the upper classes would have just a few outfits. You'd have um, maybe three, four, five different um, outfits. And that trickles down all the way through the lower classes because fabric was so incredibly expensive. Um, so people reused it constantly. You see a lot of dresses in museums now that have fabric from the 1720s, but a silhouette from the 1760s, because you're not gonna just throw away a perfectly good fabric, you're gonna remake it. 
Um, you're gonna change out the trimmings constantly. So that allows you to have some variety and freshen up your style um, while not going completely over budget. And that was part of the construction of 18th century dress was they, um, dressmakers would leave room so that things could be adjusted. There'd be wide seam allowances um, potentially so that you could remake it in a different style um, when a new trend came in. And there was a huge market for the trimmings. The dressmakers made the base dress, but then a completely different person trimmed the dress. So you could change those out and really mix up your styles. So you bring up an interesting point. Um, we just got a question from someone in the audience. How long does it take to make a dress? Obviously you can change things out and you might be just doing some kind of basic alterations, but what does the typical timetable look like? Colonial Williamsburg does a wonderful demonstration of making a dress in a day. And they will make a full 18th century upper class dress in a day. Um, that is obviously not the typical turnaround, um, but it does go to show that these things can go together quicker than we think. It is, of course, all hand sewn. This is before the sewing machine. Um, so it could take, um, you know, my research doesn't really focus much on the construction, so I couldn't give you an exact estimate um, of what a typical garment might take to construct. I would guess probably a week or two. Um, me personally, I'm not doing this full time and I'm not a team of people, I'm just one person. So my stuff takes several months to make um, because I just do it in the evenings as a hobby and just by myself as opposed to having an entire workshop at my disposal where you know one person would hem things while one person would work on the petticoats, that sort of thing. Excellent. Um, Angel, do we have anything else that people have been asking? Please ask us questions. I obviously could talk for days, as could Katie, um, but do we have anything that anyone's asked? Um, so I did want to jump in and say we are at our time limit. Um, we are going to keep going, taking as many questions as we can, um, but we understand for those who need to get back to their work day um, and not talk about clothes. Um, we've gotten some questions about resources and getting, where do you get those historic resources? Is there anything, you know, book you recommend, online resources, and then We've had a little bit of conversation about historic fabrics um, and how you know you access those and where do you buy those from, that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there are a ton of resources out there, more than ever, um, especially online. Uh, so many historical costumers out there and so many of them have blogs where they talk about the construction and how they're creating these things. Um, American Duchess is a company that they um, reproduce historical shoes, but they also have a wonderful, wonderful blog that goes through all sorts of different um, topics about historical construction. Um, there's wonderful, wonderful books out there. There are a lot of um, books from the time period that are available on Google Books, um, where you can look at embroidery patterns and construction methods. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of research that's been done um, in looking at the actual extant garments and taking patterns from those garments and kind of working backwards to see how they were constructed. Um, so there is just a lot, a lot out there. Um, a lot of wonderful museum catalogs that talk about dress, um, in terms of sourcing the supplies, I usually go online um, to get my silks. I don't really have a local silk company, but um, it just takes a bit of practice to kind of find the, the vendors that work for you. Um, the real key, I think, with the fabric is finding a pattern that works. Solid colors, pretty straightforward and easy, but finding a pattern that really truly represents the period um, can often be difficult. So stripes are always an easy thing, um, but there are a lot of companies out there that recreate historical textiles. So if you want a historically accurate printed cotton, or if you want um, one of these elaborate woven silks, uh, you can go to these specialty companies and they will make them. The elaborately woven silks will cost you an arm and a leg, um, but they are out there if you are motivated enough. <laughs> Jackie asked, um, where do you source your fabrics from and what kind of silks do you use or do you prefer using? Um, well, so silk is a fiber and then 
it just depends on the weave. So I've got a silk taffeta um, for this striped dress, which is a very simple weave. Um, it's just over, under, over, under, and it creates this lovely, can you hear the rustling sound? It's a very crisp type of fabric. Um, my false front and my petticoat is a silk satin. So that's very sh the shiny weave. Um, and that's very soft and lush and delicate. Um, so it's really just about knowing what um, things were, were worn then, brocades and the types of textiles that were used. Um, I source my fabrics from all over. I've just got a lot of different websites that I kind of have bookmarked and keep an eye on when they have sales. Um, that's the big thing, because silks do get pretty pricey, but you can find a lot of good deals if you dig deep enough. Um, there's also a lot of, as I said, companies that recreate things, and I do want to give a shout out to my friends over at Burnley and Trowbridge. They have a wonderful historical textile selection, all the way from cottons and linens to silks. Um, they're a great resource for uh, that sort of thing. Awesome. Um, that actually brings up a really important point I'd love to ask. Um, how do you get started in this? Obviously, uh, it's a little bit of a specialized field. A lot of people, they hear fashion history and they think that they have to be this incredible seamstress, which clearly you are. Um, but those of us that are thinking about getting started in this, what, what advice do you have? Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, don't be afraid. Just jump right in. Um, I come from an academic background, so I have a lot of the academics, but in the world of historical costuming, that's not required, you know? There's so much out there, and if you see something, just go for it. Um, there's a lot of patterns available now, both commercial and you can buy um, books that have patterns taken from historical garments. That's a great place to start because that helps you understand the pieces and how things come together. Um, there's lines of patterns in the major commercial patterns that you can are a great tool to use uh, to start getting, um, uh, get your start uh, in understanding how these things come together and having step-by-step -step instructions. Um, I would definitely start from the inside out. Start with your basic garments, your shift, your petticoat. Number one, you're gonna need them. Number two, they're very easy to make. Um, a lot of 18th century garments in general are based entirely on squares and triangles. So it's not as complicated as you think. And from there, you wanna work your way out. Um, as I said, there's a lot of tutorials online these days. Um, so just start Googling and you will more than likely find someone who's already made the type of garment you want and a lot of pictures of how they put it together. That's wonderful, because I think one of the things at the museum, we do dress in costume from time to time, and I know you, you and I have had this conversation before, being actually dressed the way they did, doing the things that they do, it gives you a better insight into the way that people are living and breathing in this space, the way that they move, the reasons that they do the things they do. So it's, it's always so exciting to see people that want to get involved in sort of understanding the way that uh, that way that fashion influences lives and the like. Uh, in terms of sort of why you do what you do and kind of what you're interested in in terms of um, historical costuming as a way of getting at the history of fashions and textiles, can you tell us a little bit uh, as we sort of wrap up here about why you think it's so important to study this? Why, what you think it tells us about the 18th century? I know that's a big, big question. I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but I think that's one of the things that we think about when we think about history is the question of why. Yeah. Why, why do we do this? <laughs> Um, well, my academic research and my historical costuming don't have a lot of cross-pollination um, in that my research is more on um, the theory side of things, but I will say that having recreated so many of these garments really does give me a much better understanding of how they worked, how they went together, and as you said, immersing yourself in that history, how they move. My posture right now is very different. Um, the way you walk, the way you feel. Um, but I think it's just so important because uh, I think it was Louis the Fourteenth that said fashion is the mirror of history. And it's so true. Fashion is such an incredible way to get a window into every other aspect of history. So I talked a bit about this earlier. You see economic history with trade networks and you see the history of globalization with, you know, uh, 
Western Europe would go colonize something and then adopt a lot of their patterns and fabrics and styles into their own fashion. You see political history. Um, a lot of my research is on the philosophical history and how different philosophies um, about man and nature, um, how that ends up getting reflected in textile design and in dress. Um, it is, there's so many different facets. Um, there's social history, obviously, different social classes, um, men's fashion, women's fashion, gender history. It's all so beautifully captured in fashion that just one dress can give you a perfect window into an era and is really the gateway into learning so much about who people were and who these, you know, their lives. And it's an intimate way of looking at it as well. I always like to tell people in school, you know, we read about these historical figures and they don't seem real, but these were real human beings. And they had a favorite food and they had their best friend and they had pets and families and a favorite color and that one guy from work that they really didn't like all that much. And in studying the actual things that were on their bodies, that they lived their lives in, that directly connects you to that person who lived on basically a different planet than we live on today. Um, but it's that direct line to them. So it's always very exciting to use fashion as sort of a gateway into the broader historical world. That is exactly why we do what we do when it comes to history. It's giving us a window into the way that people think. And I honestly truly can't think of a better note to end this on. Um, I think that was such a great way of thinking about all of these things um, and thinking about the way that fashion uh, directly reflects the world that these people were living in. So I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining us for these programs. Uh, we at the museum are enjoying spending time with you virtually uh, as we do our museum from home programs. Uh, we have particularly enjoyed getting to connect with people, getting to be here during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and getting a chance to be welcomed into your homes as we're talking about why history matters and all of these things to keep you both learning, entertained, and connected to this world. So I just want to take a brief moment here to thank Katie for joining us. I can't thank you enough for being willing to spend half an hour getting dressed for us there today. <laughs> going off your costuming and kind of sharing your tips and tricks and some of the research that you've done. I also really want to thank the people that have been supporting us during this closure. The museum made the really tough decision to uh, cancel all in-person programming uh, while we're dealing with this pandemic to protect both our staff, our visitors, and our volunteers. And we truly could not do it without the people that are supporting us through this, especially as we're offering all these programs for free because that's why we're here. Uh, we want to be here for you during this. So I really want to thank everyone who's been nice enough to support us for this and our partners for joining us on these programs and the like. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you'll join us uh, for our next program that's actually going to be on May 7th and Angel here uh, who's been uh, sort of facilitating this conversation for us and asking your questions and offering tech support. She's actually going to be the one speaking next time. Uh, she's going to be talking about Rosenwald schools in North Carolina, particularly as the museum works to preserve the built environment of Charlotte with a particular school, Salom School. So we really hope that you will come and join us for that. Thank you again for joining us today. If you have any questions, please email the museum. We are so happy to answer them. Uh, definitely check out the Time Traveling Redhead on Instagram, on Facebook, on her blog, and uh, take a look at all these incredible designs. So thank you. I hope you all have a wonderful day on this rainy day in Charlotte, and we hope to see you again soon. <laughs> Bye. Thanks.